So uh, welcome everyone from around the world. Um, uh, we really, really appreciate the interest that we've had uh, in this webinar. Uh, and we're astounded by the response. Hopefully there'll be something of value to all of the speech pathologists and ENT surgeons out there tonight. Uh, thank you, Chris, for sharing the first contact model. Um, I, I think it's fantastic and we're excited to be involved in that and seeing whether it can make a uh, real impact upon the delivery of healthcare, both here and around the world. So I'm going to speak a little bit about um, our experience with uh, the change that we've all experienced around the world, uh, and a little bit about ENT telehealth triage of laryngeal problems, uh, and then moving on to remote monitoring of laryngeal airway disorders, because these are the challenges that we've really faced uh, ourselves uh, in our practice and, and at our hospitals over the past uh, few months. Let's see if we can get this moving. So this is uh, the Blackburn Building, University of Sydney. Uh, it was uh, opened in 1933 as the Rockefeller New Medical School via a grant from the Rockefeller Foundation and it was demolished in 2017 to make way for the new health sciences campus at the University of Sydney, incorporating the Faculty of Medicine and Speech Pathology. And uh, this is what's coming later this year, uh, which is an exciting new building, which, which an entire campus will move to. And uh, up here, on, I think we're on the fifth floor, is uh, our dedicated voice lab, which we're very excited to move into later on this year. So when all of this is over, you're, more, you're all invited to come uh, and welcome to visit us there at the voice lab. So this is what the world's been like since uh, about uh, mid to end of March, certainly for us, uh, it's been turned upside down. Fortunately, Australia now is in its rightful position at the top of the world, uh, but that's debatable uh, by some of uh, our uh, attendees out there. Uh, so what have we learned since this COVID-19 crisis? Uh, we've learned that most people uh, will have mild to moderate flu-like illness and recover especially younger people. We've learnt, we've identified the high risk groups, uh, that is the elderly, um, people with comorbidities, including hypertension, respiratory compromise, cardiac comorbidities, cancer, possibly immunocompromise um, and obesity. Uh, males, for some reason, seem to do worse than females overall and potentially the role of cigarette smoking has been raised as um, one of the explanations why there's such a big, uh, big change and big um, uh, difference in mortality between some countries and others. So what's the bad news uh, since this? Well, we know that this virus is extremely infectious and it can be transmitted both via droplet and aerosol transmission, and that's scary for ENT surgeons. Uh, we know that uh, the virus, which is the proper name is the SARS-CoV-2 virus, can survive for hours today on, today's on surfaces. And there's a two to 10, to 10 day silent carrier period uh, during which people can be transmitting this virus unknowingly. Uh, there's potential loss of taste and smell, and we don't know whether this is permanent or temporary. And there has been reports of death or serious illnesses in ENT surgeons uh, who have been treating uh, patients both in the clinic and on the front line. We think that this is because a high viral initial exposure leads to more severe infection. And we know that there's an extremely high viral load in the pharynx um, in this particular coronavirus, uh, I think more than a thousand times higher than other coronaviruses such as MERS and SARS. Uh, people who uh, are exposed to mucosal aerosol, aerosol generating procedures are at high risk. And this includes um, transnasal and transnasal and transoral endoscopy, cough reflex testing, and non-invasive ventilation and all, and all the normal things that we do, including laryngectomy care and tracheostomy care. So what recommendations have we received and many other ENT surgeons have received around the world over the past few weeks? We've been advised to delay 
all elective ANCT surgery here in this country and to do urgent uh, cases only. We've been asked to triage patients to decide who needs urgent care. Uh, we've been advised to reduce risk by minimising face-to-face contact with patients, by screening patients uh, prior to direct contact, and by minimising the amount of people in the waiting and consult room. And we've been advised to wear appropriate personal protective equipment. So when we're thrown into the deep end, what do we do? Well, um, we either sink or swim. There's been a change in rules, there's been a change in mentality, and this has had to lead to a change in our practice and a change in the way that we deliver healthcare. So how have we adapted here in Australia? And I think all around the world, um, I, I think that there has been a rapid transition to telehealth uh, delivery of care. Uh, we've been trying to gather as much information as we can before the consultation uh, and that means getting a detailed referral so we can triage the urgency of consultations. Uh, we're no longer accepting referrals that say please review this person for their voice or please see this person. Um, we're now asking questions prior to seeing the patient about their symptoms uh, and we're collecting patient reported outcome measures prior to the consultation that allow us to be armed with as much information as we can getting going into this uh, consultation. And we're also gathering important information during the consultation. Um, in, and this is more important now in lieu of the fact that we can no longer perform routine laryngoscopy. And that might include a history, a perceptual voice examination, or evaluation and a basic physical exam as much as it can be done over the, um, uh, over the uh, webcam. So what do we want to get out of our telehealth consultation? We want to be able to formulate a likely diagnosis uh, and using some of the framework that Chris has been working on, we want to figure out whether this person is likely to have an organic lesion and this is especially with uh, voice disorders, a functional problem, or could this be an organic problem with a functional overlay? overlay? If it is likely to be an organic lesion, is it high risk or low risk? Does this need to come in uh, to be assessed in person or can it wait a little while while we implement other treatment? We triage the person uh, based upon their need for physical examination and laryngoscopy. So uh, is this person a category one, two or three laryngoscopy? Uh, and we haven't assigned particular times to each of these categories because the playing field is changing every single day and we're getting new information every day. Certainly the category one patients need to be seen sooner rather than later for laryngoscopy. And we're advising the category three patients that it may be some time now um, before they have a formal laryngoscopy due to the current crisis. And the other thing that we're do, hoping to do during the telehealth consultation is to begin remote treatment. And that might include identification of any medical comorbidities that may be contributing based upon the history uh, and other investigations. And it certainly in our practice is um, involving a much earlier referral to the speech and language pathologist uh, and and that's without a definitive, definitive diagnosis, which we don't normally like to do. There are certain challenges uh, associated with this new model, which I'm sure we're all experiencing. Uh, the field is changing and we're receiving new information on a daily basis, which is changing our practice on a weekly basis. Um, it's been challenging to get the staff uh, trained in new systems and new processes. Patient compliance has certainly initially was, was very, very challenging because people were very resistant to the idea of seeing the doctor over, uh, over the phone or over the internet. Um, and there's certainly technical challenges with video conferencing. And that might include um, the internet connection of yourself or your, your client um, and the ability of um, some of our patients to, uh, to use the internet 
uh, is sometimes limited. And so we've had to do some via telephone. And I, I don't think you get as much information over the phone as you do with a face to uh, telehealth face consult. Our data collection systems have had to be streamlined. We're now developing uh, mechanisms for online questionnaires. And I'd love to hear whether anyone has anything, uh, any tips or anything existing um, that they're currently using. Uh, billing has been a problem because we didn't have mechanisms for billing until last week uh, of patients uh, delivering telehealth care. So we were doing it for free or work, make, work, making workarounds. And, and certainly the availability of uh, PPE and resources has been challenging. So that's the first part of my talk. And I'd now like to uh, move on to a little bit about remote management of laryngeal airway patients during the COVID crisis. So an airway patient is someone with a suspected or confirmed upper airways obstruction. Um, and that can either be fixed at any of the subsites of the larynx, or it can be a dynamic or functional airway obstruction, including the subgroups of uh, inducible laryngeal obstruction, laryngospasm, and even some breathing dystonias. There are many pathologies and many causes. So when we're seeing a new airway referral via telehealth, we really want to figure out what's the diagnosis? Is this likely to be a fixed or dynamic obstruction? What is the urgency? Uh, do they need to be seen acutely and be sent to hospital? Is this a subacute problem uh, that can wait a little while or is it a routine problem that you're not so concerned about? When do they need to be scoped, category one, two or three? And what other tests can we do in the meantime in lieu of laryngoscopy? And also, can we start some sort of treatment, either speech therapy or breathing retraining or medical treatment? It's a little bit different for existing airway patients. We have a number of them uh, which are regular patients. Uh, when we consult with them via telehealth, we want to know whether their symptoms have been stable. Is their airway safe at the moment? Is there an urgency for laryngoscopy? And how can we monitor the airway remotely so they don't have to come in and be seen uh, and have a scope or go to theatre to monitor the airway um, in this current crisis? And the most important thing um, and the reason we've contacted all of our airway patients is we want to be able to develop a plan if the airway deteriorates during the COVID crisis. Uh, we were relying heavily on office-based steroid injections prior to this. Uh, but because this is an aerosol generating procedure, uh, I don't think it's currently advised uh, by anyone uh, as a maintenance procedure for uh, post dilatation uh, airway stenosis. So we need to start to look at other tools for airway monitoring at this uh, critical time. And that can include subjective symptoms, uh, using respiratory function test data. Uh, endoscopic examination is a tool that's not as easily accessible at the moment and also imaging. So how do we track symptoms reliably? When the patient comes in, we ask them, how are you doing? Are you getting increasing short of breath? And they'll let you know. Uh, sometimes they complain of coughing, irritation and mucus plugs. Um, but we need a standardised tool to track progress over time. Um, we're lucky enough to have uh, the dyspnea index, which is um, uh, there and with a reference underneath uh, from um, Jackie Gardner-Schmidt uh, and her group. And um, I find this to be a fairly reliable way to track people over time um, and to judge whether our symptoms are getting worse, uh, better or stable. And I encourage all of you to, to think about implementing that as a routine patient reported outcome measure uh, in dyspnea patients and airway patients. Uh, this is a really nice diagram out of um, Guri Sandhu's uh, excellent thesis, uh, which you hopefully you've all read. And it shows the uh, characteristic types of flow volume loops um, that we can get in different sort of airway disease. In particular, if you look at the middle one, uh, this is what we're dealing with in a fixed airway obstruction, such as a tracheal stenosis or a subglottic stenosis, where there's truncation of the uh, expiratory loop and the inspiratory loop. 
when we're dealing with a, a more functional problem, we expect uh, more like the number four pattern here, um, where the expiratory loop tends to be okay, but the inspiratory loop might be truncated. But once again, with inducible laryngeal obstruction, we need to actually have the patient symptomatic whilst we're doing the flow volume loops. Um, and prior to the COVID crisis, we would routinely do flow volume loops on patients when they came in and try to induce uh, their obstruction if, if, if it was a intermittent one to see if we could demonstrate this blunting of the inspiratory loop. Um, this is a typical example of a subglottic stenosis patient uh, before and after treatment. You can see there's a truncation of the expiratory and inspiratory loops. Um, we measure in particular the peak expiratory flow. Uh, we look at the peak inspiratory flow, which is very low in this lady, and this is the flattening of the loop. And you can see that six weeks after an office space steroid injection alone, uh, all of her numbers are improving. The dyspnea index is dropping from 21 out of 40 to eight out of 40, and that's a, a good result. But you know, we can't necessarily do these loops now um, remotely uh, unless it's been done at the GP. And I even think then that that's been classified a high risk uh, procedure and investigation. So what numbers actually matter in subglottic stenosis? There is some good literature on this. Um, Reza's, uh, Nuria's group um, published in 2013, looking at the ratio of FEV1 to peak exploratory flow rate. Uh, and this was shown to correlate with the cotton Meyer grading. Um, There's a paper from Kraft in 2015, which looked at peak inspiratory flow, peak expiratory flow, and FEV1 over PEFR, and showed that this improved after subglottic surgery, uh, subglottic stenosis surgery. Uh, Carpenter showed that peak expiratory flow, that's um, which we can do at home, can predict the need for surgery. And, and they demonstrated a cutoff on their rock curves of about 240 litres per minute or 4.4 litres per second, which is in line with a lot of um, what our patients are reporting uh, in our practice. And more recently, there was a nice paper uh, which summarised a lot of these uh, in the laryngoscope uh, from TL, which really showed that... Um, Peak inspiratory flow rate predicts the need for surgery uh, with, and they showed a cutoff and showed that this correlates with the dyspnea index. So we can't at the moment use peak, expiratory, peak inspiratory flow rate, but we can get people to measure their peak expiratory flow at home. And we've been encouraging people to do this as part of their daily routine. Uh, they're advised to use the same device each time for consistency. Um, uh, this is the, the upper device here is um, one of the devices uh, that's, I think it's Asthma MD that's available in the States. We don't have that readily available here. So we get our patients to use a very um, basic um, peak flow meter. And I think whatever they start using, they should continue using. I sort of like to standardize them for research purposes um, throughout our practice. Um, we need to really explain the benefits of these devices and the monitoring to improve patient compliance. Because prior to um, the COVID crisis, uh, many patients just wouldn't routinely measure their peak flows. We had some that were adamant about it and would do it daily. Uh, the compliance has improved um, since we've had to remotely monitor them. And we give them the advice to do three trials uh, and, and record the, um, the highest one. Um, some of the tips that some of my patients have given me is to choose a device with a sculpted, not a round tip. I don't know if that makes a big difference, but um, I've been told that uh, it's more comfortable. And to ignore the manufacturer guidelines for, for when you need to be worried uh, about uh, the numbers. I think it sits at about 500 uh, for asthma. We're going to be working much lower than asthma. Um, now, we get our patients to upload this to an Excel spreadsheet, which, we, uh, which is shared with us. And this is the sort of raw data that you can get. This patient has been extremely compliant and does uh, daily or second daily measurements. And you see this raw data uh, over time. The problem with raw peak expiratory flow measurements is there's a lot of day-to-day -day variability. It can vary by up to about you know, 50 um, litres per minute. Uh, and so one of our patients was very clever and she's come up with uh, averaging the data, which gives you a much, much smoother curve. And if we, if we can graph this over time, 
uh, we can see what happens with each intervention. Here, she's had a dilatation and the average peak flow has gone up to over 300, which is good. She's tracked along for a while, gradually down, a rapid decline, which is characteristic of people with subglottic stenosis. And then they're back up again. They're cruising along, back down. Uh, here we injected her with uh, steroids in the office and she shot back up again, gradual drift back down. And, um, and this is when we started doing serial steroid injections and we're trying to keep her up again. Uh, I worry now that we can't do this, that um, we're gonna have a lot more people diving a lot sooner. How about imaging? Uh, maybe imaging can be more useful in the current climate. Um, it can be useful as a baseline or to compare with previous exams. Uh, this is, uh, we're getting people now to have a CT neck non-contrast in Valsalva because our radiologists have advised that this gives us the best view of the subglottis and we're now getting them to do 3D airway reconstructions also if possible. Um, and we use this as an adjunct to other measures. Um, we can do it non-contrast, um, it's fairly low radiation load um, and they're still doing CT scans for um, patients, at least here in Australia. So this is a 49 year old patient that had been receiving post dilatation office based steroid injections for subglottic stenosis. And uh, she didn't follow up for a year and she called to make an appointment last week because she was worried about her airway with the coronavirus. Um, so we asked her to have a CT scan and you can see there she's got um, some anterior indentation uh, off the trachea and uh, of the airway. And then we go back and look at her video from a year ago. She had a transnasal tracheoscopy a year ago, which once again, we cannot, can no longer do in the office. Uh, and here you'll see, I hope that's projecting well, here she's got um, that subglottic stenosis, which is pretty consistent with what we see on the CT scan, which she had done recently. So this is a year ago down the bottom and more recently uh, up the top. Um, her dyspnea index has been stable. Her peak flows have been stable at around 3 to 320. I'm not worried about this lady. She does not need to come into surgery. She does not need to come in for a more formal examination. Um, let's see if we can move on. So what advice are we giving our laryngeal and airway stenosis patients during the current crisis? We're telling them to assume that they are high risk if they're infected with the coronavirus. Um, we're not really sure, but it, look, I'm, I'm, I'd be worried if I had someone with a narrow airway um, who got the coronavirus. Um, we're asking them to monitor peak flows daily and to enter it into a shared Excel spreadsheet. Uh, we're asking them to be careful with practicing social isolation and recommending that they work from home if possible. Uh, we're also asking them to check in with us on a monthly basis and to notify us more acutely uh, if they deteriorate. And we're also developing with them an action plan in case of um, them contracting the virus or their airway deteriorating. And I think this depends on where you are and uh, what your institutional um, resources are and capabilities are. And I think this should be customised to each patient. So when do we worry or want to start to intervene with airway patients? Certainly if they have progressive symptoms as demonstrated by a worsening patient reported outcome measures, if their exercise tolerance drops, or if the patient really becomes concerned, um, then we, we might say, hey, uh, this might need to be triaged higher. If they have a sustained decrease in their peak expiratory flow. Remember, this is patient specific and device specific um, and a drop over one day shouldn't be a cause for alarm. But if it's, if it's drifting down over a week or two, we need to be worried. And certainly if they're having progressive narrowing on imaging, then we need to intervene. So what do we do um, to intervene if patients are, are going downhill? Well, I think all patients should have at least a COVID-19 pre-screening. And there's word and um, discussions here about whether every patient who's having an airway intervention should be tested uh, prior to the intervention with uh, two negative um, uh, coronavirus uh, tests, either swabs or serology. Uh, that's still kind of in, in the process of being worked out. Uh, certainly, if they're an acute patient, they should be treated acutely. But if they're subacute or you just need a look, then I think you should really think about um, the screening and the and testing process. Um, there's two places we can 
deliver further investigations and care. The first on the left is in the office. Um, and our advice in the office uh, now is to avoid anaesthetic sprays um, because that can increase aerosolization of the virus. We're, we're using cotton pledges to anaesthetize the nose. Uh, everyone's wearing appropriate personal protective equipment um, and we're avoiding uh, other types of mucosal anaesthesia such as laryngeal gargle, uh, which means we can no longer do office-based steroid injections and we can no longer do transnasal tracheoscopy at this point in time. In the OR, once again, um, everyone needs to be wearing appropriate personal protective equipment and um, for aerosol generating procedures, uh, that involves at least an N95 mask um, and face shield for every single person in the theatre, uh, preferably a powered respirator, uh, although the evidence for that being better is not clear yet. Um, we want to avoid aerosol generating procedures where possible, so um, uh, high flow nasal oxygen such as OptiFlow Thrive and jet ventilation um, I think should be avoided if possible and looking at apneic in ventilation and looking at doing the procedure as quickly as possible. Um, I think laser procedures are probably considered also unsafe in this current environment and we certainly should be thinking about um, ways to make incisions uh, without generating aerosols and that might involve just cold steel or potentially coblation, although I understand there's a suction and aerosol generation element there. Um, and um, thinking about whether we need to dilate this person or just get in there and do a preventative steroid injection. Um, what are the appropriate outpatient procedures for the clinic? Uh, the aim here is to reduce risk to healthcare workers and patients. Um, certainly, if you look at our, a picture of our front desk, we've got hand sanitizer available. There's, uh, there's signs there, um, warning signs. We've got signs on the door not to enter if people are sick. Um, everyone gets a temperature check on arrival. Uh, we're minimising the amount of patients in the waiting room uh, to a maximum of, of three. Uh, we're separating the consult and the examination rooms. So all examinations are done in one room. Uh, that's been stripped bare uh, so we can clean it in between patients and the consults are done in another room. Um, we're minimising the amount of people in the procedure room. You're only in there if you need to be in there. Um, where there is a full room clean between patients. And if we're talking about what kills coronavirus, we've extensively um, sort of investigated this. Unfortunately, we can't get isopropyl alcohol anymore in Sydney. Um, so we've managed to, to look at other, other things that have been shown to kill coronavirus, and that includes sodium hypochlorite, which is bleach. Um, we've managed to source some ethanol at 100%, uh, which we're diluting down to 80%. And hydrogen peroxide has also been shown to be efficacious in killing the virus. So we're using uh, these agents uh, for cleaning every single surface, every single hard surface uh, in between patient examinations, the handles of scopes. Um, and um, scope cleaning is, is another question that I received just prior to the webinar. And I think there's no um, good answer at the moment. Um, certainly high level, cleaning uh, as per hospital protocols is not available to every outpatient clinic. Um, the, the surfaces which uh, don't touch the patient, including the handles and the, um, uh, and the scope the part that goes into the processor, we're using um, uh, ethanol at the moment. Uh, we're not using it on the sheath of the scope because we think it's high risk, just giving it a quick wipe down. And then, um, uh, there's some evidence that our standard scope cleaning uh, with, uh, I think it's um, benzalkonium chloride, uh, that's just been TGA approved in Australia, uh, one of the benzalkonium chloride agents for uh, killing coronavirus, and that's what we normally use. Um, I think it's Cytex OPA, uh, although every single institution will have a different option. Uh, certainly, I understand that the Tristel wipes um, they've been suggested to be uh, very efficacious as well for killing coronavirus type um, agents and, and that may be another option uh, depending on your institutional requirements. Um, 
a negative pressure room. There's been talk about a negative pressure room and we're certainly looking at implementing that in our practice uh, just so if you do do an aerosol generating procedure, it's not blown back into all the other rooms and we've turned off our air conditioning whilst we have patients in the office to minimise the chance of transmission through air conditioning. How about PPE? Uh, what do we use? Well, first of all, who needs to use it? Certainly all the healthcare workers need appropriate PPE. Um, do we need to give it to our admin staff? Our admin staff have um, uh, reusable uh, masks that are with N95 filters. Uh, they wouldn't be suitable for hospitals, but they're probably good enough for day-to-day -day use. Should we be giving masks to patients? Certainly anyone who's coughing or if you do anything to them where they could be coughing, I think is very reasonable to provide them with a surgical mask. Uh, but there are limited resources and limited availability. And this um, depends upon your location in the world, your healthcare system, um, upon your institutional guidelines, and, and certainly upon the governing body guidelines, which are sometimes different to the institutional guidelines. Uh, some of the considerations we need to have are, uh, do we need masks and if so, what type? Uh, surgical masks, uh, N95 masks or, or proper respirators. Um, here you can see our nurse with a, a powered respirator that uh, covers her nose and mouth. Um, anything we use that's beyond a surgical mask needs to be fit tested. There's no point using an N95 mask um, if it's not fit tested um, because it'll have a decreased um, efficacy. Uh, people need to be aware of donning and doffing procedures and certainly there's been a lot of training in our hospital over the past um, month or so and developing protocols about what, what equipment are we using, how are we going to put it on, how are we going to take it off because the infection risk uh, for healthcare workers is mainly in the doffing. And, and then there's questions about reusing masks and, and can we clean, how do we clean the equipment once we've used them, when do we clean it? Uh, certainly I have colleagues um, in New York who's, which have been badly affected uh, that have been given one N95 mask to use for the whole week at their hospital. And to me, that's very, very scary if you're going to be treating patients. So in summary, um, I think we can all agree that this current COVID-19 crisis has had a significant impact upon our laryngology practice. Uh, a rapid ad adaptation has been required by all, all the healthcare workers involved in treating such patients. And that means adaptation of um, telehealth, triage of uh, clinical examination and triage for endoscopy. Um, we've certainly been referring earlier to speech pathology uh, as our speech pathologists have um, been able to um, also de develop telehealth uh, models, which Kate will speak about, and the use of enhanced personal protective equipment. Uh, for airway patients, I think there needs to be a way to triage new patients remotely. And I think we can all think about um, implementing remote monitoring measures. Uh, and I think it's also important to formulate a management plan early before these people go down. So I hope that's been of use uh, to you uh, today. Normally around this time in Sydney, we have the Festival of Lights, the Vivid Festival. And this is a picture from last year. I think it'll be canceled this year, unfortunately, uh, due to social restriction, but hopefully in the future, um, it'll be back up and running and we welcome you to come and visit us uh, when this is all over. So thank you very much for your time.